This is an image of a fox carved onto a pillar at the archaeological site Gobekli Tepe. Located in southeastern Turkey, Gobekli Tepe is an incredibly ancient site, dating more than 11,500 years ago to what archaeologists call the pre-pottery Neolithic Age. It's older than Stonehenge and older than the Egyptian pyramids by thousands of years. Among the site's most notable features are its monumental circular buildings, each anchored by huge T-shaped pillars decorated with animals. Wild boars, leopards, vultures, ducks, scorpions, snakes, spiders, and of course, foxes. For all you fox fans out here, you might recognize this posture, a known hunting technique when foxes leap up and dive bomb their prey. So these images are not just evidence that the people of Gobekli Tepe were skilled artists, but keen observers of nature. So what can we learn from this? Ever since the site was first excavated, archaeologists have theorized that these buildings served some sort of religious purpose, used for ritualized gatherings. But the specifics of these religious beliefs and practices are very difficult to reconstruct. With so little to work with, some archaeologists have argued that the animal iconography at Gobekli Tepe could shed light on the religious worldviews of the original population, hinting at what some scholars today would call an animist perspective on the relationship between humans and animals. From this perspective, animals, plants, and other features of the natural world are considered part of an interconnected, reciprocal network of beings, each with their own agency and personhood. Maybe we're seeing evidence for the belief in animal spirits. But what's the evidence for this? And can we even apply the term animism to Neolithic religion? In an article published in 2020, the archaeologist Oliver Dietrich says that of the 72 pillars discovered thus far, 51 have some sort of image. Some are abstract symbols, but most of these images are of animals. The most common animals depicted are various types of birds found on 24 pillars, snakes appearing on 19 pillars, followed by foxes, wild boar, leopard, and an extinct species of cattle called aurochs. Full sculptures have been discovered as well. As recently as 2023, a statue of a wild boar was discovered in one of the circular buildings. A prominent quadruped can be seen clinging to one of the pillars, which appears to be some sort of big cat, maybe a leopard hunting a boar. The animals on the sides of the pillars around the perimeter are almost always facing inward toward the center, and many of them are portrayed in motion. This orientation led the original excavation director, Klaus Schmidt, to call the enclosures animal gatherings, places where animals have congregated, leaping toward the ritual space of the enclosures, to quote another archaeologist, Caswaldo Busaka. But these buildings were not just animal gatherings, they were people gatherings too. Benches running around the inside wall of the buildings lead archaeologists to assume that these were used for some sort of communal activity. The T-shaped pillars were also part of this gathering, because they aren't just pillars. They're actually abstract anthropomorphic statues. Some of the statues even have arms and loincloths. So let's imagine the experience of gathering in one of these buildings. We're talking about semi-subterranean buildings, probably with a roof, at best lit by flickering firelight. And you're sitting there on the benches with other people, surrounded by faceless anthropomorphic figures, possibly your gods or your ancestors, and also surrounded by animals. The archaeologist Caswaldo Basaka, who I just quoted, calls this a ritualized encounter between humans and animal spirits. Now, we don't know the specifics of this ritualized encounter, and I'm not even sure if we can call these animals spirits. But whatever these gatherings may have entailed, the animal iconography probably held special significance, because hunter-gatherer societies across cultures and across history often demonstrate a deep sense of connection between humans and the natural world, a relational understanding of the natural world that views animals, plants, and aspects of the environment as having personhood just like humans. This is a concept that some scholars today call animism. Now I'm going to add a big asterisk here. Classically defined by the Victorian era anthropologist Edward Tyler, animism is the belief that everything, and not just humans, have souls or spirits. In his words, the belief in the animation of all nature. Animation not in the sense of cartoons, but in the sense of the Latin word anima, meaning breath, but also soul or spirit. In fact, that's where we get the English word animal, as something with the breath of life, inspirited, or ensouled. 
But many scholars of religion have rejected animism as an analytical concept because of its inaccurate and racist history. European scholars like Tyler back in the 1800s and later were obsessed with the origins of religion, and they argued that the indigenous peoples of places like Australia, West Africa, and the Pacific Islands were examples of people in an earlier stage of religious development. This was a social evolutionary theory that was self-serving for colonialist powers, who argued that non-Western peoples were more primitive than Westerners not only in technology, but also in religion. Tyler and others argued that animism was a primitive cognitive error made by early humans, an error of attributing personhood to what he considered to be obviously non-persons, like an animal, mountain, or stream. And so, in his mind, Europeans and supposedly civilized later stages of humanity corrected this error and evolved out of animism, to something like monotheism. So scholars have since mostly abandoned the term as a racist relic. There is nothing inherently advanced about monotheism that would make it more evolved than so-called animist beliefs. There's also been a move more toward context when it comes to studying religion. We always want to study beliefs and practices in their specific cultural and historical contexts. So we view big cross-cultural categories like animism with suspicion as too blunt of a tool. But a lot of archaeologists who study Neolithic religion are reviving animism as a useful scholarly category while claiming to leave behind its problematic history. Graham Harvey is probably the most famous of these so-called new animists, who defines animism as the recognition that the world is full of persons, only some of whom are human. From this perspective, animism is not a belief system per se, and certainly not the original primitive religion, but a way of living in a relational manner with non-human entities. The archaeologist Anna Fagan argues that this is a way of living often seen among indigenous religions, which emphasize that animals, plants, and material life can potentially act as subjects, or persons, with reflexive consciousness, agency, and intentionality. Now, personally, I'm not sure how useful the term animism is to describe this worldview. It has a lot of baggage. Some academics have pushed back against resurrecting it, saying that it's more of a metaphor than an actual category of religious practice. To which I'd agree. I wouldn't say that the people of Gobekli Tepe practiced animism, but the metaphor of animation is a useful metaphor insofar as these people seem to have had a relational attitude toward animals. The archaeologist Oliver Dietrich has argued that we can see this relational attitude in how Neolithic art frequently alludes to a blurry boundary between humans and animals. For example, consider this figurine from the nearby Neolithic site Nevela Chori. Viewed head-on, you can see a humanoid face. But from the side, it looks more bird-like, with wings and maybe a beak. Dietrich argues it gives the impression of a human wearing a hooded cloak, and possibly even a mask. Now, whether or not we agree with his specific costume theory, the design does support the theory that Neolithic people in the region had a cultural framework that assumed you could cross the boundary from animal to human, human to animal. Some also theorize that Neolithic ritual specialists in the region dressed up in animal costumes. The artists at Gobekli Tepe were perfectly skilled enough to depict animals accurately and naturalistically, but there are a few sculptures of cranes in particular that look a bit odd. Like all birds, the legs of cranes look like backward articulated knees. Now, for all of you bird nerds out there, I know it's actually the ankle joint, but anyway, we see this apparently backward anatomical structure in birds around the site. But some have surprisingly human-looking legs, thicker and bending the other way. Is this evidence of some sort of ritual specialist wearing crane costumes? Some have pointed to a crane bone unearthed at another Turkish Neolithic site called Çatalhöyük, which indicates it may have been used for clothing. In particular, they found a wing bone where the large flight feathers were once attached, and cut marks on the bone suggest it wasn't butchered, but rather prepared to be displayed, and possibly hung from a human shoulder. So archaeologists have argued that crane wings were worn by Neolithic ritual specialists in rituals like dances. Dietrich and others have argued that artistic representations like these are animist insofar as it seems the inhabitants did not recognize a strict line between animals and humans. They may have assumed that animals were persons. There's also evidence that points to the possibility that the population had special connections with specific animals. For example, specific animals are more common in specific buildings. Snakes are most common in building A, foxes in building B, boars in building C. Members of the excavation team have argued that this may be evidence that each enclosure was built by or for different communities or clans, with the respective animals somehow being associated with the respective groups. The fox in particular plays a prominent role throughout the entire site. Foxes are found in almost all of the buildings, and often on the central pillars. 
Fox bones consist of 8% of all mammal bones found at the site, including fox skulls. Moreover, on the anthropomorphic central pillars of Building D, their loincloths appear to represent fox hides, which may have been an actual article of clothing that the people wore, or possibly worn specifically by the ritual specialists. Moreover, the bones of a fox tail were found near Pillar 18, which Oliver Dietrich theorizes may mean that the pillar was decorated with an actual fox hide, or someone deposited clothing near the pillar for some unknown reason. All this to say, the fox may have held some significance in their mythology, cosmology, or ritual practice. Dietrich theorizes some sort of shamanic helper spirit, but this is a theory we'll explore in a future video. So there's a strong possibility that the people of Gobekli Tepe held a worldview in the sense of Graham Harvey's definition of animism, the belief that the world is full of persons, only some of whom are human. The border between human and animal may have been fluid and porous. Animals may have been viewed as powerful spirits, and these animals may have played an important role in their mythology. Members of the excavation team have argued that the animals and symbols on these pillars depict mythic narratives that would have been intelligible to their original audience, but their original meaning and significance have long since been lost. Since the physical evidence is so ambiguous and so fragmentary, the best we can do is reconstruct the broad brushstrokes of the original inhabitants' religion, what they feared, revered, or considered sacred. In this respect, archaeologists have pointed out that the animal iconography is largely predatory, male-centered, and aggressive. Many of these animals could be classified as dangerous, like spiders, scorpions, and snakes. The snakes in particular may depict the venomous Levantine blunt-nosed viper. Other animals are skilled hunters, like foxes and leopards, and are often shown in the act of hunting. We already mentioned the fox pouncing technique, but other pillars show them stretched out as if stalking, and predators are also shown baring their teeth. Wild boars, famously a powerful and dangerous animal, are depicted bearing their tusks. And when the opportunity arises, animals are often depicted as male. There are a lot of, let's say, phalluses, as any self-respecting archaeologist would say. The archaeologists Ian Hodder and Lynn Meskel argue that Gobekli Tepe is an example of widespread Neolithic phallocentrism the privileging of maleness as a prime cultural signifier, and the centrality of masculinity, both human and animal, as a source of power and authority within the material and symbolic repertoire of the Turkish Neolithic. Now, we shouldn't overstate this evidence too much. Less ferocious animals do appear on the pillars as well, like ducks and cranes, but scholars generally agree that there's a bias toward dangerous or ferocious animals. Taking this together, one archaeologist calls these enclosures not just animal gatherings, but theaters of predation, where people came face to face with threatening predatory powers. And from these observations, scholars have tried to reconstruct aspects of the population's religious ideology and rituals. Some have argued that these animals functioned as protective imagery. Across cultures and history, societies have deployed aggressive imagery as a magical strategy to ward away dangers, like malevolent spirits, sickness, or human enemies. Others have argued that by carving images of powerful or dangerous creatures, the people created a way to interact with these formidable spiritual beings in a safe and controlled manner. The archaeologist Anna Fagan argued that by depicting them in art, the population was able to interact with volatile animal spirits on their own terms, within a structured and ritualized context. And any rituals conducted here were probably mediated by ritual specialists. So others have argued that the aggressive imagery basically functioned as a Neolithic media campaign used by an emerging religious elite. Threatening animals showcased the dangers that the community needed to overcome together. This not only reinforced cooperation within the group, but also justified the existence of powerful protectors, male ritual specialists who various archaeologists have characterized as shamans, individuals who claim to have the skill, power, and ability to navigate the spiritual realm, and who were strong enough to protect the community from both natural and supernatural danger. Now, it's hard to prove any of these theories, but it's safe to conclude that aggression, killing, and consumption were part of daily life for this society. After all, we do call them hunter-gatherers. So it makes sense that these societies would have developed rituals, taboos, and mythologies around these themes. To quote members of the excavation team, this predatory iconography may reflect the dual symbolism of hunter and prey, life and death, and the close relationship between these principles. And here's where that relational worldview may come into play. So-called animist views of animal-human relationships can lead to various rituals and taboos around the act of killing, stipulating how animals can be hunted, how the carcass can be treated. Quoting Oliver Dietrich, 
If taboos are broken and animals maltreated, they become predators themselves, dangerous to the hunter. Humans may have been part of this ritualized life cycle as well, not just as the consumer, but the consumed. The archaeologist Anna Fagan points to images of birds carrying decapitated human heads, and their headless bodies, which she interprets as possible evidence of so-called sky burials, in which human corpses are disposed of by being fed to scavengers. She speculates that these people saw this as a way for the human soul to be released. Looking at the animal iconography of Gobekli Tepe and its focus on hunting, killing, and consuming, what emerges is potential evidence of a relational worldview with nature, which may have permeated their rituals, mythologies, and beliefs in the supernatural, in which non-human entities were not just resources to be used, but active participants in the ritual life of the population. So a bunch of the footage from today's video was my own footage I shot on location at Gobekli Tepe on a recent trip to eastern Turkey. I visited the Pool of Abraham and Shan La Urfa, the Iron Age Urartian citadel overlooking Lake Van, and of course I spent a ton of time scrutinizing every detail of Gobekli Tepe. I'm constantly traveling, and over the years I've found that NordVPN is an absolutely essential tool for all of my devices. By connecting to one of their over 6,000 servers in 61 different countries, NordVPN enables me to access geo-blocked websites, which is vital when researching video topics. It also encrypts my internet connection and keeps my browsing history private, which I especially value when I'm accessing public Wi-Fi in airports, hotels, and the occasional Turkish cafe. By the way, do yourself a favor and try Turkish breakfast, it will change your life. NordVPN also comes built in with a feature called Threat Protection. This is an additional layer of security that seamlessly integrates into the NordVPN app, which includes a feature that warns you about phishing links, as well as features like a blocker for malicious ads and dark web monitoring that alerts you if your passwords have been leaked. Go to nordvpn.com rfb to get a two-year plan with four additional months for free with a huge discount. It's risk-free with NordVPN's 30-day money-back guarantee.